Okay, hello everybody. It is so nice to see you all here on day two of General Assembly. My name is Jen Galanato. I'm the Regional Affairs Director for Region 2, and I'm here with my colleagues and fellow friends, Region Region 3's very own Regional Affairs Director, Angelica Campos, as well as Region 9's Regional Affairs Director, Gerardo Chavez. And we're here to present to you graphics. Take it away, Gerardo. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I know you had a very long day. Uh, two workshops, uh, resolution debate. Uh, I mean, if you've been here from the very beginning, I appreciate uh, that you're sticking with us for the last workshop of General Assembly. This is how we are concluding our workshop session. Uh, so with further ado, uh, I just want to touch briefly on some of the goals for today. Uh, today, our goal is for you to have a greater understanding on how you can correlate graphic design with your advocacy. Um, advocacy doesn't have to be boring. Uh, whenever you're posting uh, statistics or anything that you want to reach out to your students, it doesn't have to be boring. Uh, you know, we're not in the 2000s anymore where, you know, you have uh, word art or whatever it is, uh, we have a much modern and sophisticated way to uh, reach out to students. And with the pandemic, uh, we've seen how social media has become essentially the primary outreach to students. So our hope is that you're able to take a little bit of, um, of the skills that we're going to be teaching you today and apply it in your advocacy, whether it is through uh, your region, student body association, and overall just life in general. So we're gonna start briefly with a little bit of history on graphic design. I'm a history major. So every time I talk about something, I have to give context for you, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. But design has been, ever since the dawn of civilization, uh, we see it in, the, in, in its ancient origin, as you can see right here on the screen, uh, design can be traced back 38, thousand years. That is a very long time before Common Era. And we saw this sign in cave paintings. Uh, we also saw it in Chinese printing, uh, medieval calligraphy, uh, Sumerian paintings, uh, pottery in ancient Greece. Um, and a little but fast forward uh, into the industrial area, that is where we saw machi machines creating design. So we no longer have it to, you know, uh, grab a chisel and then just you know carve anything on the on the on, on the cave. But now we have very sophisticated uh, machinery that's able to do it in a very quick and efficient way. And we saw it through the uh, government press. Uh, if you took like a history class, whether it is in college or even in high school, we talked about the industrial area and how you know we saw the machines. How it just you know you see the newspaper just printing, 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 printing. Uh, thousands per minute, uh, but we also have the chromolithography, and it really opened the doors for fast advertisement. Uh, we no longer have like a very um, inaccurate depiction of the anatomy of a human, uh, but now we have you know a more sophisticated way to convey elements and design. And now the modern era, uh, we have software. You know, with internet, we have software just uh, as um, Adobe Illustrator. Canva, uh, so we no longer have to use the methods of the past. You know, we don't have to use ink. We don't have to use uh, tools from our ancestors, uh, but we simply just have to turn on our computer. Uh, we can even do it from your phone. That's just how uh, far we have come along uh, with uh, modernizing uh, graphic design. But before we touch base on graphic design, it is important to talk about color. Uh, color has its own theory. Color has its own uh, psychology. And whenever you see a color, um, your brain uh, creates a chemical reaction that delivers a emotion, or maybe it even gives you a memory uh, from the past or an experience that you had. So we're gonna be talking about color. But before we get into the details, I want to start with this quote that uh, is really the foundation of what we're going to be talking about. And it's by George O'Keefe. And it says, I found I could say things with color and shapes that I couldn't say any other way. Things I have no words for. Uh, sometimes we find ourselves in experiences that 
our words cannot simply, uh, how can I say this, express our emotions. Uh, whenever, you know, we receive a surprise or when somebody's telling us a compliment and we're just shocked and we're like, oh my God, you know, I, I have no words to describe it. Um, sometimes when we look at our posts, uh, we want to cram a lot of words. You know, we want to give a whole explanation about why it's important that, that you should run for student government. Uh, but to be frank, students are not looking for words. They're looking for a quick way to get a message, right? Uh, if you're if you're scrolling through Instagram, uh, sometimes unconsciously you're just swiping through some feeds, some some profiles, and you're not paying attention to the content. And that is what we have to keep in mind that shape and color that is how we're conveying a message. So we're going to start with the color wheel. Uh, you probably learned about the color wheel in kindergarten, uh, and we're just going to be going through the basics. So we have this great color wheel. Um, the primary colors, obviously, is red, yellow, and blue, as you can see right here in the middle of the color wheel. But then we have secondary colors. So we mix primary colors with each other, and that is how we got the secondary colors. So we have purple, which is um, red mixed with blue, and then green, green, blue mixed with yellow, orange, red mixed with yellow, but then also, um, if you look at the color wheel, uh, yellow, there are different types of shaders. Oh, also overlap with yellow. So we have orange right here. We have some different types of yellow, uh, orange. But then as it gets closer to the yellow, they start sharing some commonalities. And that is what we call tertiary colors. Uh, if you are either a graphic design major or an art major, you know that saying the word red is very generic. Um, it's just like saying, um, you know, can I get some water or can I get a nice tea? It's very generic. You're not giving somebody specifics on what kind of water do you want? Do you want Aquafina? <laughs> do you want uh, Dasani? What, what, what is it? But it's just like a color. Uh, whenever you're, uh, let's say like you're going to decorate your house. You're going to repaint your walls, right? You can't tell the interior decorator, I want red, because there are literally millions types of reds, types of reds. So as we can see right here, we have red orange, which is this area right here. And then we have yellow orange, which is right here. So that is how you see how they're sharing. And honestly, like there are different types of shades, like for blue, like you can say um, a navy blue, a coral blue, a sky blue, they're all different. And the point of going over this is that uh, you know uh, what kind of colors you want to use when you're creating a, a graphic. Um, are you going to be using a green? You know, what kind of green do you want to use? Um, is it just going to be a swamp green? Is it going to be a lemongrass green uh, or an alien green? Uh, so that is how we have to keep in mind. And this is going to become relevant when we explore. Canva. So a little bit more about color is that we have shape, tint, and tone. So we're going to start with shade. And the shade is created by adding black to the basic hue, darkening the color. So as you can see, we have a very generic red, the typical red that you probably see, you know, in Burger King or Netflix. Uh, but as it starts getting closer to the right, uh, it starts darkening, and that is because you're adding black to the basic hue. Um, it's just like whenever you're uh, just, you know, dropping, like if you're into painting uh, and, you're, and you're mixing your paint and, you know, you have your primary colors and you want to make a dark red, you're just adding black. And then you're mixing, mixing, mixing until you get uh, whatever color you want. Uh, for tint, uh, it is created by adding white to the basic hue. So it is the opposite of shade. So we're just adding white to lighten the color. So we have this red, but as, it's, as it gets to the right, um, it starts turning pink. And eventually it'll, it'll turn to white. Just like for the shade, um, you can see how it starts turning like, like a brownish and black color. And then lastly, a tone. Uh, tones are just a subtler versions of the original color. Uh, this is just to make it look less pastel. So you add gray. 
uh, to the basic hue. Uh, so gray is just you know black and white mixed together. So we're going to do an exercise, and you you can either uh, put in the chat, uh, but we're going to just put put this theory to the test. And as you saw this yellow color, a bright yellow, a sunshine yellow, uh, what is an emotion that you got? And you can share it in in the chat, please. Like, what is the emotion that you got when you saw this yellow? I'll give it a couple seconds. So we have calm, we have sunny day, yeah, joy. We have happiness, happy. All right, so we, yeah, fun. So we get the point. This is a very vibrant color. Um, and little, little do we know that sometimes when we're shopping at the store or we're going to purchase food, uh, corporations use color to grab your attention and make you feel a certain way. Uh, we all, you know, pretty sure we all been to McDonald's. What is McDonald's related to? You know, we see happiness, a happy meal, right? So they have to use yellow to convey that emotion of happiness. So what is the meaning behind yellow? Optimistic, playful, happy. Uh, we see an Easter, we see it throughout uh, spring, right? A lot of people in the spring wear yellow. How about blue? What does blue make you feel like? What is the emotion that you got or an experience? Calm, calm, confidence, formal, calm, relaxed, trust, intelligence, interesting. All right, so we're, we're yeah, we're definitely, uh, you know, relating our emotions to the color and, um, you know, everyone's right. Blue, um, the meaning behind blue is tranquility, calmness, trust, loyalty. So that is why you see some of a lot of banks or even social medias uh, using the color blue or anything that involves um, confidence or trust, right? So for example, Chase, the bank, they use blue. And the main strategy is that you know, they're taking your money, they're going to, you know, save your money, they're going to guard it. They need to feel, they need to make sure that you're trusting them. So they use blue to make sure that unconsciously, your brain has some type of calmness to it. Also, when you're purchasing, um, or maybe when you're using Facebook, you know, Facebook, they use blue. So that's going to create some type of emotional reaction that you I feel trust, I feel, I feel trust here, you know, I feel confident in calmness too and loyalty. How about purple? What is purple? How are you feeling when we look at purple? It's Sacramento Kings. <laughs> yes, we see fun. Uh, sleep, spiritual, calm, relaxed, creativity, Barney, royal. Yeah, everyone is correct. Luxury, yeah. Um, you know, a little bit of uh, historical context before only royalty could use purple. And if you were seen roaming around the streets using purple, you know, you were either killed on the spot or persecuted. Uh, so uh, I'm glad that we have we have um, freedom to use whatever color that we want. But yes, purple does relate to royalty, uh, majesty, nobility, also spiritual and mysteri uh, mysterious qualities. So if you're into horoscopes, uh, if you're into the zodiac signs, you're probably gonna see that they use a lot of, a lot of purple uh, because they want to add that uh, mysteriousness, that spirituality and mysticism to that. And then lastly, red. What is red? Um, what do you feel when you look at red? Powerful, power, love, passion, fire, extension, strong. Yeah. So we get the point. Danger. 
my everyone is absolutely correct. Uh, red is a a color that's been used throughout you know centuries to signify power, um, anger. Right. We all seen uh, Inside Out, the movie. <laughs> the character that's angry is is red, um, and in heat. Right. He is. Um, you usually when we see a sign that something is hot, it is red. Uh, danger, love, passion, Valentine's Day. It has to do a lot of a lot with red and pink. So thank you everyone for participating. And now we're going to go through the elements of design using Canva. So I will click out of here. And we're going to get a little bit more interactive. Uh, so some of the designs, I, I remember when I first learned about design, I was taking a photography class in fifth grade. And we were talking about how to make a picture look more engaging. So today we're going to be uh, discussing how to make the post that you're going to create for Instagram more engaging. So we're going to start with lines. Lines help enhance and direct and create movement. So you can use lines to, uh, you know, make the audience follow something. So when you're looking at a maze, your eye, you know, kind of follows the pattern of, of the line. Also repetition, repetition helps tie individual elements together. It adds a consistency to a post. Uh, so for example, if your uh, St. Patrick's Day just passed, um, you know, a lot of the things that you probably saw were like hats, uh, bands, clovers, you know, and it adds that repetition to uh, tie the theme together. Um, also color, color, a strong color palette makes for a strong design. Uh, just like how we talked about, you know, you're probably scoring through hundreds and hundreds of posts throughout the day. Um, but if it doesn't make, if, if you're not using a strong color to catch the attention of the viewer, you know, you're at a loss there. So you have to use a strong color, uh, not just to catch your attention, but uh, you know you want to make sure that the viewer is connecting to it, that they feel something. If you're pers um, persuading a student to run for uh, student government, you know what is the color that you're going to use? You know what do you want them to feel like? And also, uh, other elements is transparency. Uh, transparency allows elements to interact with each other as we can see right here. Um, but also like if I wanted to, you know, use transparency in Canva. How it looks. You can also incorporate texture. Texture gives depth to flat designs. Um, you know, that is where we have to use our common sense and, and ask ourselves what does, what looks two dimensional and what looks three dimensional. Even though we're looking at our computer, a flat screen, you can still add texture to your to your post. So, for example, like if we look at this, the texture is you know a crumble paper, and it adds that dimension to your post. And then also we have grid, and I'll touch base on this right now because we're gonna explore some of the features here. But the grid helps you align and arrange elements. So now we're gonna explore some um some features and please feel free to ask any questions at any time i know we're gonna uh, be done in 30 minutes but i want to take time to also answer your questions all right so using canva uh, one of the questions that i get asked the most is canva free canva is free and, but you're also able to purchase uh, what it's called canva pro and it unlocks uh many other uh premium features uh for example like let's say like um we're gonna be talking about elements. Uh, if you look at right here on my cruiser, we're gonna go to the left and then elements. And I'll actually put it to the test. So um, I picked apples. These are what you call elements. So you just search what you want. Uh, for example, like you want elections. Because I know a lot of student body associations have elections. This is how you, you know, bring in the um, elements. Um, and that's how you're able to incorporate imagery and symbolism to your post. But remember, the goal is that you use as, as less words as possible, but you still want to use words to make sure that you let people know, like, you know, the time, place, and all that information. And then photos and videos. This is very important. 
So for example, like I, I pick a photo of a dog. You're able to, you know, just drag your picture here or you can upload your own. Just like I uploaded uh, when we were doing our post for uh, Black History Month, uh, we feature uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama. And if you wanna make this circular, actually you can go to elements and that is where we see, you know, uh, lines. You are able to use lines in the elements, a uh, shape, or a frame. This is to use for pictures. And then there you go. Also, videos. Uh, this is a great way to incorporate videos. For example, like um, it will be random, but like you know, the beach. Also, um, something that is very important is the background of a post. Uh, sometimes using a photo as a background can distract the viewer from the foreground. So make sure, keep in mind that the background is what's in the back and then the for forefront is what's, you know, in front of the background. Uh, so for example, like if I were to use this as a background and I'm going to add, a, you know, words, it could be a little bit distracting and it looks overwhelming and people usually, you know, just don't read that. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, one way that you're able to also incorporate uh, subtle backgrounds is by using the backgrounds feature here. Uh, you're able to use a gradient, gradients are nice. Um, and the options are limitless, essentially. Uh, we just talked about texture. Although this looks like a drywall, but like, uh, for example, like uh, wood. Cloudy. So it's really up to, um, you know, what do you want in your post? Now we're gonna talk about animation and effects. Uh, but before that, are there any questions about uh, incorporating imagery into your graphic design? Okay, so animation, this is my favorite part because this is where essentially you can get creative as you want. Uh, so there are different types of animation and effects that you're able to use. There's animation, which as you can see right here, animate. Uh, so this is a way to add more movement into the post. It doesn't have to be still. So you can just add something like this. This is a block or um, zooming in or a rise or fading in. So it adds movement to your post and it will, it will, once you download it, it will turn to a video. Also uh, effects for the tag. So it will be right here. You can add a shadow, or if you want to be creative, you want to use neon. You can use neon if you want. It's right here. Um, now we're going to talk about the photo. Um, so the photo, something that, that Canva actually added pretty recently is um, how to remove a background. So for example, like you want to, I don't know, uh, feature somebody in the post. But then you realize that the background has nothing to do with the color that you want. For example, like even though uh, purple and yellow are complementary colors, but I don't want to use yellow on this because it looks inconsistent. You're actually able to just click on effects right here and then use like background remover. And something that you would have to do in, in Photoshop, it already does it. It already does it. You don't have to do Photoshop. It will just uh, cut out the outline of the of the person, or in this case, like the dog. And then it deletes the background and then you're able to, you know, use it. Another feature that I, uh, another feature that I do want to cover, um, it is text and fonts. 
And actually, I will pull up another link that I have here um, and that I will actually put in the chat. It's, uh, whenever I create a post or whenever I see one of my fellow communications officers or regional affairs directors create a post, uh, the part that it's very difficult is like, what font am I going to use? Because sometimes fonts uh, really ties in with um, how nice something's going to look, but also keeping in mind that it has to be legible. You know, you can't have a cursive font that, you know, you can't read it, that it looks like it's from like 17th century and people are going to have a hard time reading it. So let me add this to that. And Canva is great in just creating guides. Um, for example, like using this website, um, you're able to see what kind of uh, fonts pair, pair well together. So for example, like Lake Spartan and Libre Bakersfield, you're just able to just refer this whenever you're creating a post. Um, and it gives you some type of guidance on what's gonna look nice because you can spend hours trying to design, decide what font you wanna use, but I'm pretty sure nobody wants to sit in front of Canva for three hours just, just deciding, you know, what font am I gonna use? What, what's the font size? Uh, so for example, like uh, Leak Spartan and Evie Breakersfield. You, if you go to text right here, uh, it, already, it already has some um, pairings. So for example, like you wanna leave your email somewhere. You know, it already pairs up the fonts for you. Or for example, like, I don't know, uh, Merry Christmas. Or something like this. So keep in mind that everything, uh, once you log into Canva, everything is right here on the blue bar on the, on the left. Um, another thing that I do want to cover is going back to color. Um, and Canva is really great at helping you pick a color. So if we go back to the color wheel, um, if once you start creating what color you want, uh, it also gives you what colors ties well with that color. So for example, uh, red, or like this like fuchsia color uh, goes well with the with the green. So you're able to just, you know, um, pick a color, uh, experiment with the color that you want. And actually you're able to, um, each color has a code. So you're able to copy the code and then just, for example, like let's go back to the PowerPoint and I wanna add it to the background. These are, this is the color wheel right here. You're able to just grab the code that we copied, we copied and then just paste it here. Are there any questions about Canva, um, Canva features? I see a question, uh, hand raised from Shannon. Yes, thank you. Um, I use Canva all the time, but I did learn something new <laughs> about taking the background from the pictures. Was that under effects? I got so excited. <laughs> Was yeah, that so, text that you yeah, said? Yeah, so yeah, so let me bring back uh, the puppy. Yeah. Um, so if you go here, effects. And remove background. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Thank you. Background. Yeah, and That's it also has awesome. many other things that you're able to do. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, play around with this because it also like butchers the the picture. Uh, but another thing that I do want to mention is the filters. Uh, you're you're able to use filters for pictures just like how you do for Instagram. So you want like a black and white. Um, you're able to do that. Also adjusting, um, unless if you're you know very well very uh, well aware of you know how to work with brightness and contrast, um, but you're just able to manually um, do that yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. I, like I said, I use it all the time for all of our flyers and 
but I did not know about that. So that is awesome. And I also wanted to mention too, um, for all of you that um, if you use this or plan on using it, you, if you can find out from your um, campus for your um, campus, your colors for your campus, um, you can get the numbers so you can use your um, correct colors. Yeah, so you just, bring up a great point. Yeah, so that's what I did. I got the, the correct um, numbers for our, our blue and gold because that's our um, campus colors. And so I was able to put them in here so I have the correct numbers, um, colors that I use for um, if I want to use, you know, our correct colors for any um, of, of the flyers that I want to do. So thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions about Canva? All right. Uh, well, if you have any questions, we will have some time at the end. But with that being said, I will pass it on to my colleague, Angelica, to talk about ADA compliancy. I'll wait for that. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, now that we've kind of had a chance to go over, you know, Canva, the amazing tools that you can use and utilize to make your post engaging and your all of anything you do engaging, um, we're going to roll over into some other uh, areas. So today I'm here to talk about ADA compliancy. Um, we, you know, as students in student government and leadership positions, we want to make sure that we are holding true to, you know, our mission of diversity, equity, inclusion, and everything we're doing. And the way that this, you know, this works when it comes to graphic design is making sure that everyone has, you know, the access and ability to view uh, a post or any, any, anything you, you post on social media, whether it's a story or if it's a poster or you name it. All right, just to give a little bit of context of what does ADA mean? Uh, the American Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. So what this means is that the ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits the discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Um, so its main purpose is to ensure, you know, that people with disabilities have the same rights as, you know, you and me. Um, and <laughs> if we go to the next slide, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what is a disability. So if anyone uh, is wants to give get, give a, a a little little jab at it, um, does anyone want to kind of drop their answers in the chat? What do you think a disability is? Or you can say it too. That's fine. All right, I'll give it a second more. All right, so when it comes to graphic design, uh, one thing that I, well, one thing that I found out uh, was that, you know, disability is oftentimes the, seen seen as like a negative thing, yeah. <laughs> seen as a kind of barrier to uh, one's success. Um, but you know what, there, there are things we can do to, you know, avoid, um, I guess, barring people from, you know, accessing their classes or accessing social media. Uh, one thing that I found, one definition I found was that a disability is a combination of one's impairment, um, a poorly designed environment or product, and then one's inability to participate. So there, there are students out there who may be deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and, <laughs> you know, uh, as we kind of may have seen at the beginning of the pandemic, many uh, deaf students, students who are deaf, were kind of had, had issues with accessing their classrooms. You know, we're all moving on to Zoom. Um, there may have been, you know, <laughs> issues with getting a a ASL interpreters into their classrooms. Uh, so I kind of wanted, I so, you know, with those barriers, that is what <laughs> causes, you know, someone with a disability to be able to una be unable, sorry, someone who is, un all right, that, that, that's what causes someone to, you know, be unable to participate, whether it be in the classroom or in their community. Next slide. Simply put, 
uh, the one thing I want to, you know, echo is that we can avoid excluding, you know, our students from getting to know what, you know, what programs are on their campus. If, you know, there's elections, uh, we can, you know, we can avoid that by, again, having good designs. First step, uh, I, I think it's really important that we kind of identify what needs are in our communities. So if you go to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what are the different needs? What are the different uh, difficulties that these students have when it comes to, you know, viewing and intaking uh, the information and media that they may see. Uh, for students who are blind, uh, they, you know, have a difficulty perceiving visuals, photos, and uh, everything else. Low vision, um, I know a lot of students who, you know, I know a few students back on my home campus that are this way and you know they have a difficulty perceiving smaller texts sometimes they need may need a screen reader to you know <laughs> uh, be able to see uh, or and be able to read sometimes de decorative fonts uh, can be very very difficult to you know view for them uh, one example of this uh, my home campus is we're currently planning commencement and um, we're looking to you know incorporate uh, student speakers on our campus uh, one of the forms that we had uh, has a very stylish cursive font and you know um, people didn't quite understand that <laughs> people like in our you know commencement committee didn't quite understand how but again it 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 inhibits students from being able to participate if you know you have font that is not uh, readable then low contrast color combos is another area that they have difficulty you know viewing and intaking. Color blindness, uh, that is, you know, the difficulty in perceiving colors and different color combinations. Finally, but not, not the least, uh, we have, you know, the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, this one, uh, we, we pretty recently had a town hall um, where we got to, you know, get to know students who are deaf and hard of hearing and get to know like the issues that are facing them and how we can kind of bridge the gap. Uh, to representation for them. So those students, they definitely, you know, have a difficulty in perceiving audio and any sounds. So we'll learn a little bit more about how, you know, on, on Instagram, on Canva, we can learn how to address those issues and needs. Bridging the gap. <laughs> so as I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, having a disability, it doesn't have to be uh, something that bars students from accessing resources, accessing, you know, the opportunity to get a scholarship or, you know, get involved in their student government or, you know, clubs in their clubs at their campus. Uh, I just want to highlight a bit of a few features that may, you know, help, you know, all of our, all of our, the, what we do on our campuses to be more inclusive. So for the blind and uh, community, we, you know, it would be really great to incorporate more audio in your in, in all of your, uh, you know, the engagement and posts that you put out to your, the community. Um, using more shapes and textures or um, in person, that would be more of an in person so that that could include braille as well. Captions on, um, you know, videos. Uh, that would be another area to kind of bridge the gap for them to be able to intake all uh, the thing you're put, putting out. Um, Another thing that's a little bit uh, new, I, some people aren't always aware of, but there's a, a thing called photo descriptions. Um, there's alternative text. There's there's features on Instagram that you you know you can access whenever you're going and creating a post. Um, it's kind of a description of what the you know the photo is. All right, <laughs> low vision. Um, one er a few areas that we can address um, this is in incorporating large or adjustable text on either your websites or, you know, on your post. Um, I know some people use, you know, screen readers. Audio is another good area. And then having a high contrast color palette. Uh, for the students who may be colorblind, yeah. Uh, colorblind, it's good to incorporate more patterns. Again, back on it with that high contrast uh, color palette. And then when it comes to the deaf and hard of hearing community, incorporating more visuals in, you know, your postings in your outreach methods is really good. Captions, stellar. I would encourage everyone to do it. Um, ASL interpretation, if streaming live video, 
Um, I think, you know, as we, we have seen over the last day and a half, um, that's really, really beneficial to incorporating more students into, you know, our meetings, into our events and so on. <laughs> Next. In summary, um, I believe that it is, you know, the best, the best tip I can give you, if you can take away one thing from this, is make sure that in every, sorry, every, everything that you post and every method that you, you do the, you know, outreach to your community, you provide at least two different ways for information to be perceived or understood so that you're able to address as many needs as you can uh, for students in your community. All right, here comes the fun part about our workshop. We're going to talk about advocacy in the digital age. So how can we apply digital, or excuse me, how do we apply graphics to our advocacy? Well, let me quickly tell you about it. Next slide, please. So believe it or not, graphics can be used as a tool of advocacy. This is not limited to, but some examples that we have here, such as press releases. The SSCCC puts out a release, a press release every so often. I believe we have one from a few months ago that's on our Instagram right now. We make flyers for all of our events, like recently our Deaf, Hall, Deaf Town Hall Awareness flyer went out. I don't know if you've all seen that, but it's out there on our Instagram and many of our regional Instagrams have that as well. And we put it in our stories. If not, then there's always a cute little infographic somewhere that we also use. And that's probably the most common way we've seen it. Next slide, please. So how can you advocate with social media? Here are some of the other ways that we have seen it, but ones that you might not have really thought so much about. So quick tip and Quick tip graphics, right? They're like infographics, but they're quick, they're easy, and you can see them and you'll just read everything on there and you're like, okay, I got the information. Let's go on to the next. Using a carousel. This may or may not be something that many of us have seen, but if you look at some of the regional Instagrams, for example, region two, and I'm going to give a quick shout out to my comms officer, Kelvin Chan, who was taught this by Gerardo, uses a carousel when it comes to some longer infographics. So if you have a lot of information but can't fit it all on one quick little slide, that's absolutely okay. You can, what we like to call swipey swipe for more information and get more information while having that interactive aspect, of it, which goes into my final and personal favorite part of advocating with social media is being interactive with the viewers. I don't know about all of you, but I love it when there is an interactive post that I can go in or get a link to that directly takes me to something. I don't know about all of you, but I love shopping on Instagram or getting my information quickly that way. If not, then our stories are like that as well. Some regions like to get engaged with the audience by creating little polls or you know direct questions or even our own story takeovers for the day. Some regions have that and it's actually really exciting because with that, it increases your engagement with the audience, therefore having more interaction and kind of having this almost personal feeling with them. Like, I mean, who doesn't love that? Who doesn't wanna to get to know more about someone's day? Next slide, please. So in summary, we hope that you have gotten a chance to take all of this in and take away something out of this presentation. So just to kind of wrap it all up in one big bow before you all walk away from this session is that we hope that you understand color a lot better and can use the color wheel. We also hope that in your designs, you can make them so visually appealing that it's, it makes your aesthetic feed even better than before. We hope that you understand accessibility and what ADA is and how it complies with the law. And then go out there and advocate because we're all student leaders. And during this time, we've been utilizing social media more than ever. So with that being said, where are we at on time, everyone? We're pr doing pretty good. Is there another slide? Are there any questions for any of us? Feel free to drop them in the chat, raise your hand and we'll recognize you or unmute yourself and we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. 